Hi folks, I'm Kerry Farr. Welcome to In Your Corner. We've got a very special guest today. Jimmy Snow is with us, and I don't know if you've ever heard the name Jimmy Snow, but he's the son of the great Hank Snow, and he is a legend himself. Jimmy, it's so good to see you on In Your Corner. Oh, Kerry, it's a pleasure being with you. Thank I'm, you, I've my brother. i looking forward to this. Oh, not nearly as much as me. I want to go back and look at your career because in the beginning, you were a rock and roll singer, started out with Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and all of those guys. Kind right. of take us back to the beginning and tell us about the early days of rock and roll. Well, actually, it, it pretty much started with a guy named Tom Parker, Elvis Presley's manager. Well, when my dad reached his pinnock, he was like the number one country singer in the 50s, starting with 1951 through 1958. Those were his major years. Out of those years, my father in his career recorded 833 singles, which is unbelievable. Yeah. He's the only man that's ever been on a major label 47 years. Nobody will ever break that record, especially today. Yeah. And uh, out of that, he sold 70 million records, and he had, uh, uh, I think, 108 albums that he had released and uh, received 23 gold records in his career. So he did very well. Yes. Well, he was at a certain point. He and Hank Williams. One year, Hank Williams would be number one, and Dad would be number two, and then it would be reversed the next year. They kind of went back and forth. And uh, during this time, Dad was looking for a, a new manager, so he heard about Tom Parker, who was Eddie Arnold's manager. So he left Eddie and took over my father. Well, about the time he took my dad over, this young man in Memphis, Tennessee, was becoming a rage. Now, we hadn't heard of him in Nashville. We're only 200 miles away. Somehow or another, Tom picked up on this guy, Elvis Presley, you're talking about. <laughs> and um, as a result of that, uh, he decided, well, we need to kind of, you know, maybe bring him in. Now, what I mean by that is Parker and my father became uh, co-owners of the company called Hank Snow Enterprises uh, Jamboree Attractions. And they were 50, 50 owners of this company. So uh, Parker th said, well, you know, I needed an act, which was my father, someone that uh, uh, can draw the crowds in, that we can begin to uh, catapult some of these other people, such as Elvis Presley and myself and their careers. Because I was, I'd grown up in the entertainment business, so from the time I was three years old, that's all I'd ever known. And uh, so he was putting on a show in Lubbock, Texas. Now, Elvis was only known in Memphis, parts of Arkansas, uh, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, East Texas, a little bit of East New Mexico, and that was it. Nobody knew anything about him. But, I mean, he started out coming out the gate, and he was very popular with That's All Right, Mama, Blue Moon of Kentucky. What a lot of people are not aware of is that uh, actually there was no such thing as rock and roll when Elvis came out. None of us. We, we were all country singers, including Elvis. And he and tried to be a country singer, right? Yes, yeah. he did. Yeah. The thing that was so amazing was Dad was like his hero. We didn't know that until he started doing shows with Parker and with myself and with my father. And the reason was because Parker wanted Elvis to be on the shows to get him before these crowds in places where he wasn't known to help build his career, uh, which, you know, was... So uh, would he open for your dad? Is that what it was? That or? was pretty much it, yeah, uh, for he, a while. You, he was the opening act opening for Hank act Snow. How about Hank it? Snow. And I was on there as an opening act. And we would have others like uh, the Carter family and, uh, and, and probably Fair and Young or Marty Robbins. They weren't as big yet. But they would be on there, and some may remember Whitey Ford, a Grand Ole Opry comedian known as the Duke of Paducah. He was on some of the shows, and there'd be different ones. We go out as packages, and with what Parker and Dad would do is they put up the money. They were supposed to put up the money together uh, to put these package shows on in these different venues uh, to get all of us a lot of exposure. And so what happened, though, Elvis became such a sensation. He would close the first half of the show at the time of the uh, intermission. People wouldn't let him off the stage. It didn't matter that they didn't know him. He it was, was one it was of something those, so new and absolutely. So he was so charismatic, a very handsome fella, and uh, and, and such a, a wonderful voice. 
that uh, his style and the way he moved around and everything, which was brand new to the day. But he was introduced on the uh, Louisiana Hayride, which he became part of, as a rockabilly singer because they didn't know uh, what to call him. Mm -hmm. And so that it went all of a sudden, back then it was called hillbilly music. Right. Uh, there was no such thing as country. That came along a little later as country and western because of western swing music that identified. This, so the evolution of it would be kind of like this, hillbilly, rockabilly, uh, country and western, then country music. Mm. Uh, with the rock side of it, it was hillbilly, rockabilly, rock and roll. Now, a lot of people would argue the issue that Elvis Presley would not necessarily be coined as the king of rock and roll because a lot of people have come along since then that sold more records and he died very young, didn't accomplish what a lot of them accomplished, and they would argue that point. But Elvis was able to do something these men couldn't do. That is, he was able to tie these different genres of music into one. Like country music had its own world in Billboard, uh, rhythm and blues, pop, and so forth. So when so when he came along, yes, all of these guys, uh, you know, uh, the, like you say, the rhythm and blues. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the names from back then, but uh, Bill Haley and the Comets, Ch Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry, and and Elvis, and then Jerry Lee Lewis, and all of these all guys. of them. Yeah. yeah, right. And Carl Perkins. And so what happened was when he put out a hit record, you could see it as in the top five or ten in pop, rhythm and blues, all, all over, all over the charts. Yeah. And he tied them together so that even today, if you have a big hit record in country, it may show up in the pop or in the rhythm and blues or wherever today. So I think that's probably what brought about the idea that he was the king of rock, rock and, and roll. roll. Well, Jimmy, and we've I got was, to go to a break right now, but that is fascinating. We'll come back and look at that in a moment. Folks, stick around. <laughs> Jimmy Snow's here. He's talking about Elvis Presley and the beginning of rock and roll. And we're going to come back in a moment. And he's going to talk about his friendship with Elvis Presley and giving his life to Christ in the ministry. We'll be back in just a moment. Stick around. Hello, Joel Hemphill here. It's an exciting day to be a Christian. Blessed to have Christian television programs such as In Your Corner. Be sure and stand behind it with your financial support. Dear friend, have you ever felt like your life was on the ropes? Well, I want you to stick around because we have a very encouraging word for you. Former professional boxer Anthony Brent Cooper and his lovely wife Leanne Cooper are here to share an encouraging word with you to help you get up after life has knocked you down. Hi, I'm Anthony. And I'm Leanne. And we want to welcome you to On, on the, the ropes, ropes, where we coach you through God's Word on how to come off the ropes into victory. Today, we want to tell you how you can come off the ropes of a godless life. I don't want to live this life without God. John 15, 5 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, sure, you can do something, but nothing of true value. John 10, 10 says that I came that you might have life in it more abundantly. You know, the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're born into this world as sinners, separated from God. But even though mankind sinned, God had a plan. And it says in Romans 5, 8, He demonstrated His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And the good news is it's so easy to receive that free gift. Romans 10, 9 says, Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe it in your heart. God raised Him from the dead, and you shall be saved. Romans 10, 13, And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not about what you have or haven't done. It's all about what Jesus did for you. Confess Jesus as your Lord. Believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead. And that's how you come off the ropes. Okay, folks, we're back with Jimmy Snow, and Jimmy is the son of the great country music singer Hank Snow, and uh, had an incredible amount of hits, his dad did, but Jimmy was a rock and roll singer and friends with Elvis Presley back in the right. day, and before the break, you were talking about how Elvis tied all of these genres together. Right, and the thing that, uh, that was so astounding was 
I was sent, my first meeting with Elvis was 1955. I was sent to do a show with him in February, uh, be his opening act in Lubbock, Texas. But I was sent by Tom Parker to carry a letter of intent. They had been communicating about trying to become part of the company that Dad and Parker own. So this was supposed to have been your dad and Parker. Right. Yeah. Okay. They, they, they were supposed to be 50-50. I actually have a copy of the contract between Parker and Dad with the canceled check, signature on the back by Parker, and where it states four, it actually says, Dad writes, I am now a 50% owner of Jamboree Attractions, Hank Snow Enterprises. I, I have that in my possession. So I went out there anyway. I was really shocked. I didn't know what to expect. And he had a chartreuse jacket on, I remember that, it looked yellow, but it was chartreuse, black pants with white stripes down the side. And once I got through, I stood on the wings there to watch him. About a thousand people in that place, and man, here he went. And when he hit that stage, he electrified that audience, something I wasn't really used to. And. Uh, uh, we always identify Elvis with teeny boppers, but that's not necessarily true. I saw women in their 30s and 40s jumping out in the aisles, and I mean, what we're used to seeing today, they were doing in 55. Yeah. And uh, of course, the teeny boppers were involved too, the teenage time, but it, it affected the audience. He had an effect, a charismatic effect on that audience. Well, that, I immediately, you know, that, that just, I loved him immediately. And he was a very nice, warm person. Uh, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't curse, he didn't do any of those things. I did, but he didn't. Yeah. And I was quite amazed. Uh, you know, he was an assembly of God. He was a Pentecostal boy, yeah. raised in a very, at that day, legalistic church. Yeah. Because Pentecost in its beginning was quite legalistic. Right. And he understood that world, even though he didn't stay in it, he understood it. So he was a real gentleman. All of the things that may happen to him we read about in his latter years, I can't speak for. But I know I liked him, and I certainly admired his, uh, his ability to sing. And he used to use that kind of a gimmick at that time that Sam Phillips the, over in Memphis brought up called slapback echo, uh, which kind of makes your voice, you know, where you say a word and it goes, yeah, <laughs> like that. Oh, yeah. So, you know, he had that style already. Later on, he quit doing that. He just, his voice was so good, he didn't have to have any kind of, if you want to call it a gimmick. And um, uh, we were working a lot of shows at that time, and so he became part of Jamboree Attractions. And wherever we went, he would close the first half. Well, he, he, he was going so long that my dad finally had to make a decision. Dad was a stand-up country singer. Elvis moved all over the place. Yeah. Crowds went crazy. They wouldn't let him off the stage. So dad finally had to say, Elvis, I'm gonna let you close the show, which in that day and time was always for the star. Yeah. Dad was the star. And uh, Elvis said, okay, he didn't mind. He said, that way you can stay on stage as long as you want. <laughs> That's hilarious. Now a story went around a little bit later where people were saying, you know, that dad got mad because he made the show go too long. That was really not true because dad, if there was anything he wanted, he wanted him to succeed because the more, Fame he got, part of it, yeah. the more money Jamboree Attractions, Hank Snow Enterprises would get. So you know how stories are. So that went around for a while, but it was basically because of the length of the show, he closed it. And a funny thing I always talk about is the fact that uh, we were doing the shows, we were working with people like Andy Griffith, who was a stand-up comedian before he was an actor, and he was doing shows with us at the time, Tommy Sands. Uh, Gene Vincent, the bebop a little guy, all of these different people, Carl Perkins. One of the things that stands out most in my mind is the fact that not only was Elvis starting out as a country singer, who memorized almost all of my dad's hits. Wow. He used to come out to the house, and he'd sit there at the piano, and he always would sit at the piano and sing for Dad and I. And he could play the piano. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And just chording mainly. Yeah. And uh, he, he'd come out singing one of Dad's songs from the 40s. And Dad would go, it amazed him because he wasn't expecting this moving around type this young singer. rocker to yeah. be able to sing his music. Uh, singing songs that were not even hits in the United States from Canada. Did he ever sing I've Been Everywhere, man? I mean, no, nobody no. could do that like Well, that dad. came along after we all went our own ways. But uh, 
uh, he, he, was, he was something else. And so we'd ride around Nashville a lot of times on the motorcycles that I owned and go in and drug stores and things of that sort. And I often wondered if, if people really knew that Elvis Presley had come into the establishments around Madison here, different places in Nashville. But we worked a lot of tours together. And one of the things that stands out in my mind is at the same time, this guy, Bill Haley in the Comets, uh, he had a mega hit called Rock Around the Clock. Right. It wound up, you know, becoming the theme song in the Academy Award winning movie, Blackboard Jungle. And uh, I traveled on an entire 20, 30 day tour with him. And uh, uh, he told me himself that he was a country singer. He sang uh, in nightclubs in Pennsylvania. But all of a sudden, because he come out with Blackboard Jungle, which got identified with the rebellious movie, right. in the sex revolution of that day among teenagers, that immediately he, uh, he was considered a rock and roll singer too. Wow. But he'd, he'd, he'd do his song, and then all of a sudden the saxophone player would go wild, and he'd go down into the audience, and the bass player with the big upright yeah. would go down there, and the saxophone player would straddle the bass like a, like a horse. And the bass player would drag him up and down the aisle, and the audience would go nuts. My goodness. That was his gimmick. Wow. And the drummer would play, and this stands out. I'm standing right there at the wings watching the drummer. Probably use thinner sticks, because he made sure he'd break them when he'd really play those drums during that song. Without missing a beat, he'd go with his hands, and he'd cut his hands on the cymbals. And when the blood would get on his cymbals and on his drums, they'd go nuts. Oh, my goodness. Well, Jimmy, we've got to go to a break again, but when we come back, I want, I want you to talk about, you know, you giving up rock and roll music and going into the ministry, and we'll pick up on that in a minute. Folks, hang around. Uh, Jimmy Snow's going to come back and tell you more about Elvis and all of the early days of rock and roll. We'll be back in just a moment. you in a fight? Do you feel as if everything and everyone is coming against you? Are you tired of life beating you up round after round? You might have been knocked down, but the fight is not over. There is hope. There is someone in your corner. He knows all the right moves, so let him call the shots. He's saying to you right now, Get up. You can go no more round. His name is God. Not only is he in your corner, he actually sent someone to fight on your behalf. That someone is Jesus. Let his words carry you to victory. His word says, You are more than a conqueror. You are accepted in the beloved. In all things, I will cause you to triumph. You are destined to reign. You can do all things through Christ, which gives you strength. You are made to win. Wait! I got one more round. Hi, I'm Anthony. And I'm Leanne. We want to welcome you to In, In Your, Your Corner. Corner. I want to give you the opportunity today to sow into this ministry. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 8 that God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you may have an abundance for every good work. That's a great scripture. You know, Ephesians 5 1 says to be an imitator of God. John 3 16 says that for God so loved the world that He gave. He gave His only Son, He gave His very best. And we too have an opportunity to imitate God when we give. I'm not going to promise you that when you start giving that all your financial problems are going to go away. Because they're not. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10 that you don't work, you don't eat. There are Bible principles that you have to go by. And it's not like a jackpot Jesus. You give the money and all of a sudden you don't pull the lever down. The money comes from heaven. But I will say this. What the Bible says. You set in motion a Bible principle according to Galatians 6 7 says that God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. If 
If you've been encouraged by the programming on In Your Corner, go to inyourcorner.tv, click on the donate button, and you'll find everything you need to sow your seed. Remember this, God is in your corner. And so are we. Okay, folks, we're back with Jimmy Snow, and I don't know if you're as fascinated as I am, but Jimmy, sitting here talking about Elvis and, you know, your relationship with Elvis, he'd come visit you, your dad sent you out on the road, and Colonel Parker sent you out on the road to sign Elvis, and you and him were friends, and you'd go around and ride motorcycles in the early days, but something happened in your life, I mean, you can talk a little bit more about Elvis, but you gave up rock and roll. Yes. Well, of course, I was a country singer. Last few that I did, records on RCA, everybody wanted to be like Elvis. So I was trying to sing like him. I never accomplished the same thing, but the last two records that I had, Love Me and How Do You Think I Feel, he covered those records later and became monstrous hits. But they were good enough for me to get my new contract. I would go to his house occasionally to visit. So in 1958, in January, now I had a car wreck in 1956. I was a heavy drinker, and I was on drugs for a while. Uh, seven years of drinking, two years of drugs. And I was on this side making good money. In the music business. In the music business. On this side, I was living miserably, uh, which proves that uh, things are not what satisfy life. Right. And I, was, I had got, I'd been saved when I was a child, but I got away from God very quickly went into sin and into all this drinking. But I, but I just, you know, it would gnaw at me. Because God had his hand on my life. He wanted me to, to be a preacher. He called me. I believe there are two kinds of preachers. I believe there are those who live a good life in church all their life. They look around to choose a vocation. They choose the ministry. But I also believe that there are people that God raises up to be in ministry. And I feel always that I have been. I always felt different when, even when I was a little boy. And uh, Elvis invited me to come. I got a call from him. He wanted me to come. He was already a big star now. Jailhouse Rock was out, Love Me Tender. All that was out. He called me up and he wanted me to come spend a few days with him. So the first 10 days of January, I flew to Memphis. He picked me up just to hang out. We'd run around let's, all let's, let's go back and examine that for just a minute. Okay. I, 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 nobody else would pay any attention to this, but since I live in Nashville and we've got the interstate now, it's a three and a half hour drive today. But back in those days, you boarded a plane to go from yeah. Nashville to Memphis. I guess those country roads in those days were hard uh, to travel. They track. were a little different. <laughs> so you flew over to Memphis and then you and flew him started hanging out. And we'd, uh, he couldn't go anywhere now during the day, mobbed. So he'd rent the movie theater all night. So he had his Memphis Mafia at that time, which I learned about later. So 15 or 20 of us, we'd all pile into the movie theater. He'd pay the popcorn girl, the ushers, everybody that worked there to stay all night. Evidently paid them well. So we'd watch movies. We watched Jailhouse Rock. I remember that. It had just come out. We watched that movie and something else. I don't remember the name of the other one. We get back about 5 o'clock in the morning, go to bed, sleep half the day, go downstairs, eat a bite and sit around the piano and sing, play, which was one of the things he loved to do. Do the same thing that night, roller skate and rink. Something different every night. And uh, the main reason he brought me over there was he was making a movie called King Creo. And he had a part in it for me, which that was my dream to go also into movies. I had signed up with Actor Studio. I had just gotten back and fall of 1957, but when I had this wreck, to jump back a little bit, that took me out of circulation in 1956 from January all the way to summer. I couldn't travel on the road, I couldn't work shows. Dad and Elvis, they, they were still working, but I couldn't anymore. I couldn't go anywhere. I had a terrible wreck, and it's a wonder that I didn't die. I would have gone into the armed forces if it hadn't been for, for that wreck. God just stopped me, and I had a chance to really think about my life and my direction. While you were in the hospital? Yeah. Because you were near death? Or, near death. Yeah. I almost lost my right leg. So I went back into the business when I got back on my feet, and I did the Lawrence Welk television show in September of 1957. 
that did a lot for me because they didn't have 100 channels then. Right. NBC, CBS was just yeah. about it. Yeah. And uh, millions watched because wealth was popular. And that just opened doors up for me. So I was on my way. You know, the devil's good, isn't he? Amen. He's slick. So here I am now in a catch-22. One side of my heart is tearing at me to come back to God. The other side is saying, And Keep the world is offering you fame and fortune. And Elvis Presley is offering you a part in a movie. In a movie. And he gave me the script to read it every morning when we'd come back on our, our all-night deals. And I'd read four or five pages. And at the end of my time there, I caught myself doing something I wasn't expecting. He said, uh, Jimmy, he said, what do you think of the movie? I said, Elvis, this is great. Going to be your best, which turned out it was one of his best actors. I think so, yeah. And um, he said, well, the, do you want that part right there? And man, I... I just stood there and looked at him because that was my dream. And I said, Elvis, if you'd have asked me six months ago, I would have jumped at that. But I said, you know, I'm going home and I'm quitting my career and I'm going to go into the ministry. Going to give my life totally and completely to totally Jesus completely. Christ. And Jimmy, we've got about one minute left. Talk to, talk to people about the world and, and you know the things that Satan offers and, oh and how much better it is with Christ. Well, I can tell you right now, I had it. I had everything that people dream to have. If that's where it was, I'd still be in it. But that's not where it's at, especially in my life. I suddenly realized that happiness does not consist in things, but in relationships, and especially that relationship that you can have with Jesus Christ. And when I turned my life over to Him, it hasn't been easy. I don't have the accolades that I had then. I don't have the recording contracts that I had then. I don't even have the money, the 350 bucks a day that I was making back in those days with no overhead. I don't have that anymore. As a matter of fact, I don't have nearly anything, but I have something inside that money came by. Even through my hard times, even through my difficult times, two years of recuperating from surgery that I've had back two years ago, I can still tell you that Jesus is the only way. Wow. Jimmy Snow, thank you so much for being with us, and I think you're going to come back and be with us again next week. Bad. Looking forward to it. Folks, you've heard Jimmy's amazing story and where he talks about his relationship with Elvis Presley. Next week, he's going to come back and talk about Johnny Cash, Chris Christopherson, and Larry Gatlin. All of these guys used to go to Jimmy's church. When Jimmy left country music, rock and roll music, turned down the movie part with Elvis, he built a church in Nashville, Tennessee, and was able to minister to all of these great artists. Come back and join us next week on, at the same time, same station on In Your Quest.